thank you for joining me. We're back with another Only Friends, where our Silicon Valley chat group comes to life, direct beaming through YouTube to your brain. Today we've got Jamie Quint, now a, a, a very respectable venture capitalist, no longer alt-right. <laughs> uh, we've got Matt Fong, the uh, genius investor, hedge fund investor, and Amit Shear, the only friend of mine who has a real job on this podcast. Welcome, everybody. Thanks for joining. <laughs> the nine to five um, grind. Nine to five. He's nine to five. He's a sl working like a slave for the man. Um, how do they treat you at Amazon? What's the life? Let's get the life update from everybody. Yeah. You know, Emmett, you just turned, you had your birthday. You're on yeah. the other side of 50. How's that feel? You know, uh, I've really enjoyed my 40s. They kind of went by in a blink of an eye. It's, it's crazy to see how that happened. I, uh, he's not 50. He's not 50. He's 30. You were the same age. 30, yeah, turning the, 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 the bright young age of 38. That's right. But uh, no, they, it's pretty good at Amazon where I'm in the middle of a, of a transition between managers. Uh, but it seems like it's going to go good. Uh, I, I've known, I met Blackburn before he came back to Amazon, so I'm excited to work for him. And as he's coming back in, and we're, he just started, so uh, we'll see how that goes. I'm, it's I'm the guy that it. bought the company, right? So yeah, I mean, he's very like corporate when they justice. bought us, so yeah. yeah it's, he's, now, he, now he has to deal with it. Perfect. All right, how about the rest of you? Jamie, how's, how's, how's life being a venture capitalist? Are you, um, are you, uh, what's it like to work with Tcon? He's not, Tcon's not on the call today, so you can be honest. Like, and, and are you guys like equal partners are you are are you technically worked it for him does he have veto power over your investments i want to know all the tea oh well tegan's tegan's the managing director um but we're we're pretty equal on the investing side um so definitely invested in things where tegan was like well i wouldn't invest in that but sure and, he was like so that's I, dog I think... shit but just spend the money <laughs> well, well that's that's those are the tegan right? tegan has said that, that things Exactly. I think I've told Tegan to invest in things before that he uh, hated and passed on, and then they ended up like it would have been good investments. So I think that's like the whole philosophy behind the no veto rule. I think it's good, though, because it's good to like have someone else to tell you their objections. So you just make sure you're not missing anything. And then, you know, you could think about all the things that you might be missing. From and their then YOLO objections, anyway. and then just decide, and then YOLO, anyways, exactly. <laughs> and so, uh, things are good. Uh, we operate pretty independently. You know, we're we're chatting on on Slack out most days for a good amount of time. Uh, it's been fun. The uh, the backstory. So I don't know if I we talked about this last time. We might have. If we did, we can cut it. But like, we were talk like Jamie before he took this job with Tcon before he joined Tcon and, and they started the firm together. He's texting me like i i'm thinking about joining this company as a head of growth right it's like a very operationally intensive company like uh people who are friends of mine and i'm like don't do it that you're signing up for pain <laughs> he's like or i or i could be a venture capitalist and i was like i was like this is a no-brainer being a vc <laughs> is the literal easiest job on earth the highest roi easiest job on earth and then so jamie f takes the job and then several weeks ago, he, texted right. me. he was like, he was like, you're right. You're welcome. <laughs> I think, em, I think it told me I sounded pretty excited about the other thing. Um, and then Fong told me that VC is dying asset class and we're all doomed. Um, but I'm glad I listened I to say Justin. That. When, <laughs> when did I say that? <laughs> I think you, I think Matt, your point of view is we're at the, top of the cycle for VC. Like, yeah, you've been saying like, that for like seven years though. When's it going to happen? Like, in the meantime, all of us are getting super caked by just like YOLOing angel investments into like random tech startups that become, you know, unicorn companies because this whole thing is like a massive asset bubble. And, you know, you mean everything's not going to be priced at 100 times revenue forever? What are you what are you saying? Well, it depends what deal, right? I think like Uber Uber is still probably down from its what 17 round, 18 round, I think. Not, not down company. from the not down from the seed round though. Yeah, we're seed Fong. We're yeah, seed met. stage investors. We're seed oh, stage yeah, investors. Yeah. That's somebody else's problem. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I'm taking talking late stage 
growth pre-IPO. Yeah, yeah. yeah. See, see, there's such high variance. It's it's completely dependent on what companies you invest in. Right. All right, Fog, you give us the update. You're you're you know you started a hedge fund. You're a late stage investor. What's what's life like on the other side? Uh, well, actually, the last two weeks I spent it in LA. That was probably the biggest difference, which was different. It was nice being out of San Francisco. Nice weather. Don't have to avoid homeless people on my my way to drop my daughter off at school. <laughs> you didn't see any Walgreens getting robbed? Uh, no, no. The the one that people were sending around is actually like two blocks away from me. So it is it has become a well. I have to pass it every day we go to school, so it's not a fun ex experience. Let's put it that way. There's this, for the people who don't know, there's this viral video on, or it's like viral among SF residents and former residents of like some guy just filling a giant contractor sized shopping bag or like a garbage bag full of stuff from Walgreens while he's being filmed from multiple people and then just riding his bicycle out of the store. And he's, he's on a bicycle in the store too, which makes it very like circus looking comical, like this man <laughs> riding a bicycle carrying a garbage bag, which is not something you see in it every day anywhere let alone in a walgreens he was also, just was feeling like oh yes yes i wonder if he paid for a lift account but anyways he's just <laughs> filling the, the shopping bag with stuff from the store and then boom he's he's gone and uh, walgreens i mean it's definitely not off. an isolated yeah it's definitely not an isolated incident that's uh it's not like yeah i mean it's it's kind of like that all the time around that walgreens like you right. you walk in maybe half the shelves are completely empty the other half is completely under lock and key um so you know half the stuff you can't even get you have to order it online and then yeah they're just a bunch of random people you know hanging outside Pro probably not very kid friendly so you have to you know traverse to the other block uh yeah uh, we'll see if it changes so are you going to escape to la like emmett i don't know we'll see there's there's a big recruiting group down there right now it is, it is pretty nice down there. Yeah. We have great weather. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Do you have great so weather? Back, back to back to things that people actually care about. Like what? Tell us. Oh, one last actually. Like Wait, Justin, what did you do? Because, what was, what's what's been your update? What's your life update right now? Uh, my life update. I fasted for five days again. When Jamie Jamie uh, got to come see me on the last day, he showed up. And yeah, uh, real countdown. Took, yeah, I cooked a giant meal for everybody, uh, but I had f fucked up my fasting timing, so I was going to end at 10 p.m. because, like, the night I, st I started at, like, 10 p.m. on Sunday night and because I wanted to eat ice cream, which was, like, the stupidest thing ever. So instead of, like, starting at, like, after dinner at, like, 7 or something so I could, like, end at 7 on Friday, right, I started at, I was, like, it was, like, 9.50, and I was, like, oh, I should have some ice cream as my final thing. So then I, I had to eat, I could only start eating at 10 p.m. on Friday, right, to really make the full 120 hours. And so um, I ended up cooking, but like a ton of people came up that day, so that, that day. So I ended up cooking this like massive meal for people. And, uh, and, and Fong and Jamie were there to, to witness me, like having to watch them hungrily eat. He cooked an entire feast after he hadn't eaten for like five days. So he's sitting there cooking for like multiple hours. And then everyone else is eating his feast and he has to like sit there and wait an extra two hours while his like countdown timer on his phone is going looking very pained about his uh last minute ice cream experience it's it's gonna make a great vlog though we're making we're cutting it into a vlog that's gonna be that's anything gonna be for content anything, anything for, for the content, content. <laughs> what else i went to is miami it, um... yeah how was yeah you went to like bitcoin week right what was that like yeah bitcoin week was ridiculous it's there's so much i feel like every all these crypto people like love to have th these events and party and just you know there's this the conference was insane it's kind of like everyone i knew was in miami at this one time um Lottery all percentage of, were bros they were all bros hundred no not 99 percent. there were a few actually yeah, i met a few women who are in crypto which was great but mostly it was, I think the crypto scene is very male heavy, for sure. Um, it's like, lot. it's literally a lottery winner con. It's like, <laughs> it's, that's the like. Well, I feel like there's no, I, I think that's unfair. I think there's a lot of people who are trying to build stuff now, you know? Yeah. I, I met a lot of 
people who are new to the space or newish. They're not like people who seem to have millions of dollars that they just, you know, won because they randomly YOLO Bitcoin in 2012. You know, so I, I do feel it, there was an energy around people building stuff. I, I ended up in a hacker house actually in Miami um, at one point, which was pretty cool. Um, it felt like very was San the, Francisco circa 2006. What was the coolest product you saw? Pro what product? What are you talking about? No, I, I'm just kidding. I saw this. <laughs> these guys make here. Here's here's the the best thing I saw at. Um, well, there's two things. There's two awesome things that I saw at, at uh, Crypto Week. The first thing was I w went to this YC meetup, and I walk in, and this guy has a pack of bills. They are bills with a chip on it. So the bills actually ha are. Uh, physical re representations of a cryptocurrency, right? It's like a, uh, you can basically, cool. you can trade, you, you can give anybody this bill, but it's backed. It's, you know, it's kind of like US dollars were before, right. right? Like it's backed, it's by this, by this cryptocurrency. I mean, instead of gold, right? And so yep. um, you can, you know, any, at any time burn the bill and, and get the, the digital currency or whatever, but it's good for effectively giving people, you know, you can exchange it very easily, right? And untraceably. Because you or you know because huh. you're exchanging it physically, so I thought that was pretty cool. So these guys had all these bills and the, their own cryptocurrency that they were like issuing to back it, and I ended up like Venmoing him a grand to buy his like grand you know thousand dollar pack worth of bills, which I'm sure I'm just gonna lose, but you know yeah, it was cool. And they, they're they're pretty uh, they got pretty cool designs and stuff. That was one cool. thing. The second thing was. So I'm at this party, this crypto party at the Faina Hotel, you know, it's super fancy or whatever. And I see this guy that I know is this YC founder, like uh, from uh, he started this uh, thing called I think it was called the Immunity Project. It was basically like uh, they were working on AIDS cure. And um, he had also been like a tech, a serial tech entrepreneur. So I see him and I'm like, oh, you know, what's up to being? And he's he's like, oh, I started this crypto project. I'm like, OK, what is it? And he's got yat. It's yat. It's, and and yet, what yet is is emoji URLs, so you could buy like he's buying like a TLD dot yet, and then you can have like mine is like frog stars heart dot yet, right? So like Emmett, you could have like, you know, robot heart robot or you know whatever you want, right. just pick any emoji fish heart fish or whatever, or you could have crab, like crab, a one crab. so, crab, all the three repeating one strings are some you know url squatters immediately went and bought them right so so you can buy you could buy crab 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 though so there's also so i'm like talking to him about this i'm like okay and he's like making they're making partnerships so that you don't even have to type, type dot yet you could like type in the three you know the emojis or whatever and then like it would resolve from like different uh, browsers or or like different crypto wallets would res, you know resolve correctly right so basically, they want to sell you an emoji URL because his argument is like it transcends language, right? Like it, it, it's not you don't have to speak English to have this, you know, this URL. And I'm kind of like at first, honestly, my first impression was like, this is kind of a stupid idea. But then I started to get convinced. I started to get convinced. He's like Paris Hilton has, you know, yeah, she's got a two character one. So the two character ones are like the, the three character ones that I, no, I bought a three character one. It was like three hundred dollars, right? The two character one's like two hundred thousand dollars, and the one character one is five million dollars. I you know I don't know if anyone's bought. I mean, people have seemed to, seemingly has bought. He's like Paris Hilton bought a two character one or whatever, and so you know she bought like Princess Sparkles or something like that or a Crown Spark. I, I don't remember what it was. There's too many emoji, but they threw this incredible party like GEZ performing and like uh, I got to meet GEZ and like Paris Hilton's there and, and everybody's bought these yats. I even convinced Daniel shows up at the party, you know, my co brother, co-founder of Cruz, he shows up at the party and he's like super skeptical. And by the end of the night, he's like, okay, I want to get robot car for, for a cruise. And so Naveen was like, he's selling, a, like they're selling off the shelves. There's like tons of people are buying yats apparently. Like, you know, he was like, it's just like an exponential curve of like yacht buyers. He told me how much. You heard it here first. Go, go buy yachts. Yeah. Go buy yachts immediately. I don't know. I don't know. I don't. I'm not shilling yats. I have no investment in yat except I bought Frog Stars Heart. If you type Frog Stars Heart at dot y dot at, it resolves to my. It's basically like a link tree right now. But anyways, it's, go check it out. It's interesting what like domains wound up being valuable though, because I think people expected like English words to be super valuable. So like you know, mm -hmm. know Apple dot com because that is valuable because it's the company. But like you know Pear dot com. But actually like I think the 
short words tend to be kind of lame domains because uh, yeah. the people who buy them buy them for like SEO. And so they actually yeah. wind up like being junk. And the cool domains are like actually a little weird and they're not like just the right, random. The yahoo.com. Not... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not Google.com, whatever. Yeah. yeah. Not um, search.com. I... Right. So yeah. I wonder with the Yats, like if actually like one, the one character domains that almost seem like they're necessarily not going to be cool. Yeah. Like maybe they will be, but like it almost feels like they're going to get squatted on and then they're going to be. What they should actually do is not charge you $5 million one time. They should charge you $5 million a year and then they'd be, then they will be cool because no one will buy them who doesn't tend to actually use it. Um, right. You have to reduce right. the price, but like it should be a, it should be a, you know, Pagovian uh, like land tax on the domain name land. Like that's a, that's a better oh, yes. economic model for domains. Like a, it's like, like actually charged system. per. Yeah. I think the problem though is like he has to make, like it's like most crypto projects. He's right. got to yeah, create the to... hype cycle where people want to hype it up, right? Because right. they're like, oh, my yacht's going to increase in value. And if you're a renter, you're like less incentivized than if you own it, right? Because the idea is like, he's like, you spend, yeah, yeah. I spent $300. I own it forever. So now I'm really incentivized have... to sell you guys on yachts. No, but like, you, so you'd reduce the price, but you'd make it an annuity, right? So it's it's like, actually, I think that'd be better because then you buy in at like, instead of $5 million for one year, you buy in it, I don't know, 500K, a million dollars for one year. And then like, by the time you hit $5 million, it's been like either it's a bad idea and you should give up and like it isn't working or the value has increased a ton and you like own the, and it, it's, so you could sell it somewhat the, the right to pay that much to somebody else. And like, I actually think that would like, I don't know. I, I think it's a, it's a miss not to make them. Yeah. I short run. I'm sure he's right that it like makes more money, but I think long run, you actually depreciate like the value of the yachts goes down if, if you make them easy to squat on. I mean, I think yeah. I think domains in general would be better if you had to pay per year because there's tons of squatted domains that are super annoying because yeah. people just don't use them at all. It's like... Like the short ones. Short squatted domains should be like very uh, expensive and like long ones should be like, well, if you just want to hold on to a long one for a while, whatever, there are lots of long domains. Yeah, maybe you're probably right. It might, you're, you're probably right that it, like in the medium term because you, you want some more use, usage, right? So like things right. that drive more adoption and visibility among you know people who don't know about yat is going to like drive more right. adoption of, of yats right i'll pass totally. along that you feedback. almost you almost want to like actually what i would do if i was doing if i was them is i'd go to like prominent companies that like serve the customer base they want to buy yats and i'd give them yats and like set it up for them so like i don't know you go to twitch mm -hmm. you give us i don't know what it would be like you know the game controller tv oh, game, yeah, controller game controller tv, TV. dot yeah, yeah. actually and you then, should like, do that and there's, yeah, we don't even have to give it to us. Just set it up to resolve to Twitch so that, like, and be like, hey, I promise this will stay there for five years if you want to use it in, like, your whatever, in, in like, it's your, here. And then, like, you actually, I bet you could convince some number of companies to, like, just basically market for you if you were just, like, there for free. Yeah. Which would be very powerful. Yeah. Anyway. I love that. And then five years that. later, you're like, it's a million dollars a year. <laughs> <laughs> Bingo! <laughs> <laughs> Oops. All right, all right. Let's let's move on. I want to talk about Emmett's viral tweet storm. I, mean, I feel like it was super popular on Twitter. Probably your best performer ever, right? Uh, by far uh, my best like tweet ever of all time. It's ridiculous. We'll pop it up on the on the screen, but it's basically your you, you did a tweet tweet storm in honor of the tenth anniversary of Twitch and everything you learned uh, uh, from uh, yeah. from the the journey. Um, tell us about it. What what was your motivation? So I've been like writing down these ideas for like essays or like short, short, like tweet storms or like blog posts that I should, I should write for a long time as I've been going through Twitch, like concepts like, oh, this is like an, an interesting insight. I should like write about this. And so I have, they're all like one liners or like short things just to remind myself of what to write about in a, in a note, a note file and, and on my phone. And uh, I had this realization as I was thinking like, oh, what should I write for? I was trying to like think of what should I write about for the 10th anniversary. And I was like, I'm never actually going to turn any of these things into essays. It's like too much work. So I just took the compiled, like all of the lessons and just dumped them all into like one, they were, you just get what you get one tweet each for each of the ideas. And I actually think most of them, like there's actually probably a lot of room to expand on it. Like there's, it, there's more depth. And I actually think a lot of them aren't very clear when written in like the, the aphorism form, because it doesn't explain enough of the nuance and detail. But uh, apparently that was good. Like just d brain dumping every random thought I've ever had about how to run a startup was like a useful thing to do. Um, 
so that's like that was the idea it was fun I actually really like it. writing it was a lot of fun because I just got to like write down everything I'd what, what, what have of, I learned what, what do I tell people one of the ones that I really liked was that there was there's was only five growth strategies you know and you yeah. said that those are high touch sales paid advertising intrinsic virality intrinsic influencer incentives like twitch and platform hacks and yeah. I think that's interesting because I've never seen it defined like so succinctly yeah most of the posts are like actually someone else's idea like the make something 10 people really love instead of something like everybody kind of likes was like a Paul Buhait ism that I, 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 I rephrase it slightly but it's basically his idea and most of the things are as I say at the top stolen from someone else but that one's mine so I'm very proud that you like that one that's good um, it came out of me trying to like do YC startup advice when I was a part-time partner and realizing like People kept coming and trying to be like, oh, our growth strategy is we're going to get like word of mouth or press. And it's like, that's not going to work. And I was trying to summarize why that's just like not going to work. And I realized as I went there, I was like, okay, I'm just going to go through every startup I can think of and how they succeeded. And I started realizing there's only like a very fixed number of ways of doing it. Like you can't, you can't achieve scale like through most approaches just don't work because actually like a, a small number of them so anyways yeah i was uh i think those are i think those five actually cover it like i've i have not what seen about a counter channels example. like what? channel partnerships or channel sales channel partnerships that's an interesting idea uh most of the ones i could think of that were channel partnerships were what i would classify as a platform hack in that they were a short time window when that using that channel was like grossly underutilized and you you basically like like invest in it and like push really really hard on that channel and like where you're getting like a, a better deal than you should. And then it quickly closes and is no longer, like that's what, dis that's what disturbance of platform hacked for me. Like uh, Pinterest blew up using the Open Graph API or Yelp blew up using like restaurant SEO. But like you can't do what Yelp did again. Like once it's been done once, it like disappears. And oftentimes platforms will, but maybe you're thinking of something else for platform hack or like for a channel. Well, are we just talking about, are we talking about internet companies only? I feel like a lot of like D2C mm. companies, they just, it, they, you know, they, or maybe not yeah, yeah. see sorry like cpg companies you know they're like totally sell it into walmart or or into whole foods or something and that's yeah, yeah. Their, totally. you know it is it's it's an enduring channel distribution right yeah yeah i think that's a really good point i was thinking about internet companies that's a that's a good sixth one whereas if you're if you're actually distributing something physical the distribution channel like is actually there's only a small number of those too like to distribute something physical you kind of have to go or, into like a whole foods or retail or something you could say you could say like, those are high touch sales no, but it's different because it's like mm -hmm. it's high tech sales. Like a, an enterprise salesperson comes to you and like it's like you should buy this product, as opposed well, to like are, it's in the place you're shopping already. You're doing yeah, that think, though for like to get into Whole Foods, you have to do a high touch sale to the Whole Foods yeah. buyer, basically. But it um, it's like B two B to C. There is there is B two B to C right. distribution is a real thing actually. If you where you use high touch sales in order to get access to a distribution channel for the actual product. That's like a, yeah. a two layer nuanced version. That's a, that's a, I'd add that to the list actually. Maybe there's yeah. six. I think yeah. that's, you six. know, an example of that, two examples of that would be, one is Alto, right? Where we're you know, a mm -hmm. digital pharmacy and we yep. sell the doc, we convince doctors to tell patients because it's better for patients, right? So we're like, go right. to doctors and say, hey, you should get your patients, it's free. Give this to your patients as an option. And then that's, mm -hmm. you know, the sales, you know, one of the sales channels. It's like a channel partnership effectively. Yeah. Um, and then the other actually that came to mind is Bonobos. And Bonobos was, you know, DSC selling directly online. And in order to expand the market, they partnered with Nordstrom's to do like displays in Nordstrom's, mm -hmm. not because they want like that was like a great mar margin, di you know, high margin distribution for them. But my understanding was because it was it like introduced them to a new customer base. Right. I think well, that's why a lot of D to C, a lot of D to C companies um, actually expanded into stores for this exact reason, like the store is basically a marketing channel. It's, it's not, they're, they're not doing it because there's like amazing margin for opening stores. They're doing it because like people walk by and then they see the brand and then they try the brand. And it's the, you're, you're basically like paying a customer acquisition cost to have a physical store. Um, and that's how like some of these newer kind of D2C companies are thinking about it. Like I remember like Everlane back in the day, who I did some consulting with like a really, really long time ago. Um, you know, the CEO was like, Michael was like, we'll never open stores. And then, you know, fast forward like five or six years later and like they have stores everywhere because it works really well as marketing expense to get into kind of like new customers that aren't finding them online, for example. So I almost think of like when you run your own stores, that's almost like 
it's an it's a it's an interactive form of like paid advertising. Like your idea is yes. not that people will always buy everything in the store. It's that you're like connecting with them, sizing them, like getting them used to your brand, used to the product. And if, exactly. if your idea is eventually they'll turn into good online customers, I actually think that's advertising as a model. It's just a it's a very like clever form of ad specifically. Yes, it's marketing, yeah, not exactly. like distribution. But yeah. uh, but I do think there's the op- there's there's that. But then there's this thing that's sort of like influencer marketing, like what Justin was talking about. Alto is sort of like similar to influencer marketing, and the doctors are kind of like the influencers, like intrinsic to like the distribution of the product. Except you're you plan to like always go through them forever. You're not like they're not like part of some. It's it's inverted. Instead of them promoting go to go here, it's like you go to them, sort of the opposite direction. Yeah. But like that, I think I think that is a. That's I think that's I, I, I'm add that to the list when I when I well once once Alto then. starts once Alto uh, you know gets a customer they don't have to, like the doctor doesn't have to help maintain that relationship forever because right. you you can basically like well, choose to have your prescription sent to yeah. Alto even if you're using a different doctor or something like that it's just like it's a like good user sales. acquisition channel yeah yeah it's like yeah. it's like low touch sales you've got like uh, instead of having a bunch of highly paid salesmen you like have this massive like marginally incentivized sales force that like for some reason is like well suited to do your particular kind of uh just you know market your product sure or like multi-level marketing could be another channel if that doesn't fall within like one of these things you know like um uh, <laughs> that's true I, I didn't include scams as a as one of the categories but that's absolutely a growth strategy that's fair <laughs> well what's his name what's his name would agree with you who was super short like um uh Fong, what's the company? Bill Ackman, Herbalife. Yeah, 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 yeah. Herbalife. Um, okay, uh, one, yeah. Of, I think one of the other. N- not a tech, okay. not a tech company. Well, you know, oh, MLMs boy. are in developed markets. I think it considered scams, but in emerging markets, it is actually a form of distribution, just because there isn't the infrastructure for retail. Mm-hmm. But um, yeah. No, I think that's. I think in when it's not MLM is specifically the way you make money is by convincing other people to join the pyramid scheme, like. If you're just having people who can like be affiliates, affiliate marketing is like a real thing. That's actually, that's a good, there are companies who use affiliate marketing super, find a, like, a way to use, that's a good name for like what Alto is doing too. It's like affiliate marketing. You have to activate this massive base of people who are like affiliate marketers for you. And that like, yeah. that can work for certain kinds of products sometimes. That's a, yeah. that's a real strategy. If we're gonna talk about more of the tweet, tweets we liked. Yeah. And uh, yeah. you know, there was, the, the other one I really liked was, um, and I was thinking about it actually in somewhat of a related context, which was uh, do the job before you hire for it. Uh, so if you don't know anything about something, you think you need to hire an expert, but how are you going to hire an expert if you don't know anything about something? It's kind of like the catch-22 situation. Um, and this is always what I would tell people uh, when they're trying to figure out initial growth for their company. So... That, yeah. that tweet super resonated with me because you get these like technical founders and they're like, okay, I raise money. I need to hire a marketer. Um, and then they go out and they're, you know, they don't even know what they want. They, for, for, you know, most of the time these companies for the other tweet you were saying, they're going to grow via one channel. And so it's going to be paid ads. It's going to be inherent virality. It's going to be like sales. It's going to be one of these things. Right. And a lot of times they don't even know that. So they go out and hire either like a marketing specialist who's like, good at something that they're not going to end up needing or they hire a generalist who's like bad at all of the things because no good generalist is going to go work for a company that's like doesn't even have product market fit yet and um you know then they just end up having to fire like three marketing people in a row before they like either get lucky and happen to find someone who has the skill set they need or the entire business just fails or the entire business succeeds in spite of who they hired or like basically one of these things, but this happens like all the time and I'm sure it happens with more things than marketing. So I thought that was like a really totally. insightful tweet. Yeah, we did. I just remember with ad sales at Twitch, we like really struggled to hire ad sales people who worked. I think we hired people who were like good ad sales people. They just weren't the ad sales people we needed uh, because they, we didn't understand like how ad sales worked. And we hired people who were like, to your point, had specialties that were not a good match to what we actually needed to go do because we didn't understand what we were looking for. And it wasn't until yeah. we like went and tried to do some sell some sponsorships ourselves, sell some ads ourselves, like me and Kevin, uh, that we started. We actually managed to find and hire someone who was like legitimately really good and like scaled. You know, did our ad sales effectively. Yeah, or it's like there's even whole parts of that market that you didn't even realize existed. Yeah. Like you're like, what do you mean I have to go to CES and do dinners with people to sell ads? And it's like, well, yeah, there's five. 
massively large agencies that buy like 70% of the ads in the US every year. And yes, you have to sell to them. And no, they're not self-serve buying on your platform. One of the ones what I love was... Is... Oh, Matt, you know what, you want yeah, to... I don't know what Matt, what Matt, what Matt thought. Oh, I was or curious with the Matt? growth. I yeah, I did, I did. Um, I was curious with the growth one, which what do you think is the biggest misconception that you came across either at Twitch or as a YC partner? that people think is a growth strategy that's like a mirage? Oh, uh, I think press is the biggest one. People think that like press or BD, like deals and press are like, as that we're gonna get distribution through that. And like, there actually probably are, I'm sure you could find an example of some company that like basically platform hacked press, like they found some like way to get for slip reporters to write about them over and over and over again until they were successful. But like, it's very rare. And the answer is no, your startup will not grow through press. Like. You, I asked people like, we were talking to a couple of startups and they're like, yeah, I was like, oh, what's your plan to like acquire more users? Like, oh, we have some great like stories lined up on TechCrunch. And I'm just like, you, this is not, it's not going to, it's yeah. not a, it's like repeat. Seems like strategy. a bad strategy. Yeah. Or like an Tesla's example. Tesla's growth strategy. What was Tesla's growth strategy? I feel like he has, press wasn't mm. their growth strategy necessarily, but I do feel like he got a lot of, Elon got a lot of power. Yeah. Uh, and when f like hardcore fans through being in the news cycle a lot and like releasing like features that were very, yeah, I think he was on Twitter. He has used Twitter really well. Um, Twitter and Reddit, I think he's been right. probably the best use of those, plat those platforms. Um, Tesla doesn't spend any marketing dollars, right? Which is one of its competitive advantages. But I think, I mean, I think what, I... what happened with, with Elon going out and like getting all that press was it's really good for getting investors. If you want to get investors or BD deals or do recruiting, those things are all supercharged by press. And I, I'm, I'm sure that helped te like Tesla get people to invest because like you're just thinking about it more. So like if you're a retail investor, you're more likely to, to go like invest in the stock. It's like pr present for you. I don't know how many people bought a Tesla car because of something wacky Elon did in the press. I think that's more about the product. And like, I think it's the cars are actually somewhat in almost all physical products that you use in front of other people are intrinsically viral. Because like your friends can see you bought a Tesla and if it's dope and they ride in your Tesla, like you take, give people rides in your car. If your car is dope, that acts as marketing for the car. Like Uber is an intrinsically viral product. Like I started using Uber because one of my friends used Uber and I got into the Uber and I was like, holy crap, how did you get a taxi in San Francisco this fast? Like taxis don't work here at all. And then I got into the Uber and they're like, oh, I have this new app, Uber. And I was like, oh shit, I should, I should use that. I actually think like that's true for a lot of things like, like Tesla's. One of the tweets I, I liked was, um, you think you have a morale problem, a management problem, a recruiting problem. You don't, you have a growth problem. Nothing succeeds like success. And I feel like that's a little bit counterintuitive or people won't want to believe that, you know, to some extent, because uh, a lot of companies, you know, especially in today's, I think, environment, it's like, okay, we have to like fix all the problems and make sure everyone's comfortable and like, you know, able to work and not triggered in a safe space. And like, you know, there's, it's very employee because of the, I think because of the war for talent, uh, and the competition for talent, especially with the you know fan companies paying so much, there's you know this emphasis on on kind of catering to the employees, right? And yeah. that's kind of this tweet was kind of counter to that idea, I think, in a, in a lot of ways. I think that I was talking to Steve about this, and he rephrased it for me in a way that I thought was really like I think it's actually a better framing, and I wish I'd heard it before I posted it because I, I would I think it, it more clearly captures the idea which is uh, growth masks all problems. So like, yeah. you, you, you actually do have a management problem or a morale problem or whatever. Like you probably do have this other issue, but if you're growing rapidly, that problem will be masked and you, it will not impede your ability to do, to recruit people, to like get people to be productive. It's, they, they become very present when you stop growing. And so that has two implications. One is like, make sure you keep growing. Like, you know, that's really important. and if you can just get the growth to happen, the problems will be temporarily solved or like covered. And also while you're growing, don't accumulate too much debt in these areas that are like masked by the growth because the growth never lasts forever. There's always a period where it gets hard. And if you have too many other problems you've built up in the meantime, you're pretty screwed because suddenly they'll all become very, very apparent. Um, so I, don't, I like that framing better. And then at that point you have a growth problem again. Yeah, then you have a growth problem again. <laughs> totally. I liked, I liked the don't start a company you aren't cut out for it tweet. Um, and if I can persuade you to start a company by saying it in this tweet, then you definitely should not start a company.
Um, oh, I, and, I saw a lot of you got a lot of shade for that one though. People people were did, like, did, did I? This guy's feeling like that. Yeah, we we don't need. A, I think it was on Hacker News. Someone was like, like, what's he doing? Telling saying that like you know you shouldn't start another company like, or start a company that's like. Uh, I feel like they there was some tie in to like how it was like not cool to tell people that or maybe especially if they're minorities yeah. or something hacker news is hacker news is such garbage though it's just like <laughs> i love the, the every time the something tweet. every time something launches like i remember uh like suhail launched his his new company mighty the hacker news is just always so depressing it's just like well, you can do this already using like X, Y, Z, like pieces of technology or something, which is like the same thing people said when Dropbox like came out. They're like, well, you could just do this with rsync. I don't see why anybody would need Dropbox. It's just like, well, it turns out there's like a lot of people in the world that can't use rsync or like, you know, I don't know. Hacker News to me is so depressing because it's just like a bunch of super nerds trying to figure out how something is like there's some little thing wrong with it and then over index on that and say how it's horrible oh here's here's the comment it was like imagine if jessica were to tell female founders you shouldn't be a founder just to test whether they were determined enough i hope this kind of gatekeeping eventually dies that's you're the gatekeeper (laughs) i think that uh you always you're the one preventing you're the one preventing (laughs) you're the one emmett preventing people from starting their startup with that tweet. I said you, you shouldn't. I Except said you for the very next it. tweet, which is, it's the best yes. talk to start a company. They didn't, <laughs> yeah, no, they, 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 I'm trying to encourage people too. They did read one tweet later. What, what if they gave up at that tweet? <laughs> they were like, That's it's right. not they, for me. They read those words like, oh, I gotta go, I gotta go. I gotta go now. Yeah. So I, I actually didn't, this isn't an original idea. The Honest Tea founder came by Yale and gave a master's tea. I think you went to this too, Justin. I don't know if you remember it. Yeah, I was there. Um, I was there. I don't remember this line, but I was and there. And he, he's like, someone asked him in the Q&A, should I, like, I, I'm thinking about starting a company. What do you think? And he's like, don't start a company. If I can convince you right now to start a company, definitely don't because you're going to have to do something way harder than overcome someone telling you don't start a company. Like, and I thought that was like, it's, uh, I don't think anyone who's going to start a company is going to be dissuaded by me tweeting that. Like, frankly, I don't think anyone's like, I think that most people to regard that as a provocation um, to like go do it harder. Um, but uh, I think that you, it's really important people prepare themselves starting a company for, it's going to be pretty hard. It's not, it's not like fun. It's like exciting and interesting, but it's not easy or fun. And like, it's fun uh, sometimes, yeah. but a lot of yeah. times it's not fun. Yeah. This, and I just, I, I think a lot that of if brain you, damage. yeah, if you, if you spend, if you, if you come into it, Having gotten a lot of encouragement about how, like, oh, yeah, you totally should have a company, you've got this. I think that that sets you up for failure in a way that coming and being like, oh, man, this is going to be like a stretch, but I can do it because I'm because I don't I don't care what comes, you know, the challenges that come up. I'm going to like overcome them. That's more likely to like actually lead to success. Um, yeah. You need enough internal motivation to do yeah. it that someone writing a tweet isn't going to stop you because you're going to need a whole hell of a lot more internal motivation to actually go through with everything. Totally. And I think it's, it's different. It's different when you give sort of generic advice. I would never, ever say that to a specific individual. Like I would never say someone's like, Oh, I'm thinking about starting a company. Like, here's my company idea. What do you think? I would never like, don't start a company that sucks. I mean, unless I really thought they were like, (laughs) like if I really thought like, okay, I guess like, man, I don't know if you can do this. Like, I don't know if you have the skill set or whatever, maybe, but like, even then, I don't think I'd be inc- discouraging to a specific person out there, a specific idea. But if someone's just like, do you think I should start a company? Like, what's your advice? Then like, yeah, no, if you want my advice, if you if you need me to tell you you should do it, then you probably sh- in general shouldn't. Like you should have enough self-motivation to know whether you want to do it or not. I started to tell people they shouldn't start a company, specific people. Like when I know that like they're not, they don't really want to do the work and do it. And like they don't want yeah. to take on the brain damage that it requires. There's certain people where it's like they're not motivated enough in the right way or in the light right mindset, or they don't really want to do it for the right reasons. Where I'm just like now, I'm like, hey, that's probably not. You're gonna have to do all these things, and I don't like based on your outside, based on my perception of what you want in your life. It is completely orthogonal to what you have to do <laughs> to start a company. So you should Sorry. probably not start a company. The, yeah, yeah, that's fair. That's not me testing them or being like, oh, like I'm telling you not to, so you know that you need to overcome that. It's more like, no, no, seriously, man, you, you shouldn't start a company. 
yeah. whoever my you know, friend friendo, this is not a good idea for you. Oh, um, it's like if you know someone really well and you know what they want in life, yeah. but they haven't started a company and gone through it themselves. You're like, I know what that's like, and I know you'll hate it. Basically, yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, next topic. This one's for Matt. Uh, Biden just named Lena Khan, who's only 32 years old, the chair of the FTC. And she's uh, she's famous for writing a four years ago as a Yale law student writing a paper about why Amazon was a monopoly, which kind of kicked off a firestorm of like anti Amazon, anti big tech monopolist uh, dialogue. And I'm curious what you guys think about it, because, you know, Matt, in our group text, you were saying, hey, this is um, bad for tech big and small. And I wonder, is that true? Or is this like, you know, is kind of if we broke up the big tech companies or created further restrictions? I don't know if you guys saw there's like a there were five bills that were in progress, I think, in the House and Senate around, you know, different restrictions on the big tech companies. Like, couldn't that be better for startups right now? Like a lot of big, you know, I feel like Clubhouse being a perfect example of like a company that's a startup that basically all the big tech companies immediately started ripping off as soon as they achieve something that had some sort of user, you know, um, the product market fit. And I'm curious, like, what you guys' take on that is. Wait, wait, yeah, wait, I mean, I think... I don't, I don't, I'm not good yeah, at the yeah. news. Before we go to the, go there, is, does Lena Khan advocate, like, we should break up big companies, or does she advocating generally, like, we should regulate and, like, turn them into, like, public utilities, like, prevent them, like, have stronger regulation of big companies? Uh, I think it's generally stronger regulation. Um, so her... Uh, Tim Wu, who uh, is a professor at Columbia, um, both of them have been pretty prominent in kind of the new threat of antitrust um, thought. So, you know, before most of, you know, antitrust from the past hundred years has come from Standard Oil, from the Standard Oil case. And, you know, for that, it's mainly proving that it's bad for the consumer and that, you know, a monopoly is raising prices. Um, I think with Khan and Tim Wu, they, they consider much more of the externalities that are involved. And I think there you can debate which externalities are actually bad versus, you know, which ones might actually be good. You know, I, I think to some people, what they consider bad might be more wide reaching. Uh, but, you know, generally the idea is is to uh, regulate a lot more of, of the market practices that kind of just you know, left to the free market. So I think generally it's bad for the big tech companies. It kind of depends how they enforce it, whether it'll be bad for the small tech companies. Um, you know, they, they, they have been funded from the Open Markets Institute, which is uh, funded by my former employer, um, Soros. And I think generally the idea there, I think is much more of a pro-labor idea and kind of just anti-companies, anti-technology companies in general. Uh, so, you know, not, not just the Google and the Facebooks, but also like the Airbnb and the Ubers and so forth. And that in a lot of cases, um, the consumer or the suppliers, uh, you know, are, are being exploited by the platforms. I agree with that. You know, that's, there's this, this kind of, it, like I've seen, we've seen it for the last 15 years, you know, we've been, I mean, and I've been in Silicon Valley and Jamie and, and we've seen like just a lot of, friends of ours or people we know they like started some company they worked really hard you know they started some company that aggregated supply and then created this market and now they get to rent seek a market an entire market you know 10 to 30 percent forever of like because they were kind of in the right place at the right time and it seems like that may not be the like final destination of how you know things should be structured in in society I mean, that's how the stock market works, right? Like I, I we haven't the, had, the, I guess there's a technological change that's enabled you to do it to a much larger percentage of the population or the market than before. Right. More, which is like, more things yeah. can go through market exchanges now than they used to be able to go through market. Like it used to be, you only do like stocks and commodities and we've turned like yep. housing rooms into commodities that can be traded through an exchange. Yeah. Before, before, right. You better be able to have a monopoly in a town where you like you know, you are, are the like rental agent in whatever San Francisco or something, and you like aggregate all the supply and form this like de facto monopoly. But like today, you can because of the internet. Like before, you had to have offices, right? Like in in this random small town I live in, there's like a rental office, right? And like there's a lot of like infrastructure that goes into it. Whereas today, you can just go and uh, you know, you, like you could aggregate it all online and and get, achieve right. a much different scale, a monopoly of like which, a much which different is, scale. 
which is like generally good for customers and suppliers, right? Like participating in the biggest, most liquid market you can is generally good for everyone in that market. Like you want to have the most selection as a consumer readily available and comparable, and you want to have the most like customers potential as a supplier. So having like one big pool that everything goes into seems good. The question is, I guess, is the rake too high? Like, like is the profit margin like, cause obviously if they were taking a, you know, people were taking a, there's a nonprofit taking a 0% rake. It's hard to object to having one giant pool of like, right. You know, right. Whether, whether, but whatever not, it is that you're exchanging. Well, it's hard to say cause not, you don't right. really know, you don't really know how much, well, you know how much they're taking, but you don't know how much they actually need because you don't know how much they're reinvesting and how poorly the business is run and how much of it is just being sucked up <laughs> by inefficiency. You know, it's kind of like some of these companies, you see, you see tech salaries, but you see some of these companies and you're like, that company is 5,000 people now. And I can't think of how my user experience is materially different than when they were 500 people. What are all these people doing? Um, and you know, maybe they're doing useful things or maybe they're just sucking up all the margin that these companies are charging, doing useless things. It's hard to say. I think one interesting question is, you know, which monopolies are productive and which ones are rent seeking? Like, cause that can actually be productive monopolies, right? Like if, you know, for example, people decide to standardize on using a particular type of software, right? Excel or something probably doesn't make sense to have 50 types of Excel, right? You, you reduce some frictional costs there, but then in some other cases, like, you know, maybe, maybe it's better to have more than, you know, just one Airbnb. Cause if Airbnb treats, treats people badly, then, you know, maybe there's, there should be another marketplace, which has different rules and different norms and people would have a better choice. I mean, there, so there I think is, an interesting it's, question it's is, home away. yeah, like yeah. You can, yeah. You, you, there are two places you can go that both have supply slightly different specializations yep. well and then yep. if you're I, smart I think... like <laughs> on both sides of the marketplace if you're smart a lot of these people are you know just running outside the marketplace um especially on vrbo yep. and home away and stuff like that like i, I can yeah. imagine a world where there's good regulation of tech companies it's just generally good regulation of big companies in general i don't actually think tech companies necessarily are all that different from well-run other big companies, right? Domino's is an incredibly high-performing stock that is in many ways works a lot like a tech company does, right? Like the same fundamental dynamics driving it. Um, and so I, I can imagine good regulation. I just think like it's one of those things where like good regulation is good and bad regulation is bad. And so you look at things like uh, the GDPR, like the, the privacy debt regulation uh, for uh, that like basically it's the reason you have all those like cookie things that like do you consent to like having us track your privacy settings except all manage as the buttons like and th that has m vastly increased the frictional cost for anyone who's not part of a big tech company because y it makes it like if you don't have a basically if you don't have an account login you're allowed to track people if you don't have them logged in as an anonymous customer you're not allowed to track them which means like it grossly empowers anyone who has most people log into their service all the time, which is a, basically the big tech companies. And so the regulation actually wound up empowering the largest tech companies rather than and like defending them against startups rather than like actually enhancing customer privacy, in my opinion, um, or especially like doing any kind of like antitrust thing. And I just worry that like we want to see good regulation. Like I, can I think that good regulation is out there. I can like think that it could exist. I, don't think it, I, I think the hospital. interesting, th yeah, I mean, the history of regulation, I think is generally bad, you know, but it's, we live in an interesting time, right? Cause we have Twitter, we have social media. So like a lot of these philosophical debates that we have, like mind influence policy, right? Yeah. Um, like that happened at the turn of the industrial revolution with you know, the bimetallic standard and gold and people were debating gold, silver, you know, the fiat currency, now people are debating Bitcoin or whatever. And now, you know, same thing, but like we might come out with completely new regulations, which maybe because we have more discourse, maybe, maybe the good ideas flow to the top. Um, Wait, so what would be, let's discourse it, Matt. What, what would be a, what's good, what would be a good piece of tech regulation? How should we limit the power of hmm. overly powerful to, to large companies? So I think one idea, so I think historically regulation is bad because it hurts small companies and I think if you ask me, like, you know, out of college, I was probably more of a libertarian or whatever. 
I think today I'm, I'm much more like realize, you know, just seeing you guys and YC and stuff, it's like really hard to start a company, right? It's like the frictional costs are not zero. It's, it's not like a textbook economics problem where anyone, there's free competition, there's unlimited resources, people can create things. I think the idea of progressive regulation is an interesting one. So either by, you know, the revenue or market cap of the company or something like that. Because if we, we do, you know, if, if we do believe in the free market and actually, you know, the maximum productivity is created by truly free competition, then we want to make it as easy as possible for people to create companies that can compete with the big companies, right? So I think one interesting idea might be instead of just focusing on the regulation and enforcing it, which generally incurs a frictional cost and hurts the smallest companies because everyone has to pay that cost and the biggest companies it's a, for the biggest companies, it's a small fraction of their revenue or whatever. Yeah, I think the idea of progressive regulation is kind of an interesting one. Thinking about how the regulation affects big companies and, and companies relative to size. I think, I think that could be an interesting one where you actually do make the, the economy more competitive. And, and I think that's mainly the heart of... I think today people mainly feel like the injustice is uh, about inequality and that um, both you know, on a company level and on a personal level. And so, you know, equaling the paying field that way, I think is, is interesting rather than just, yeah, like you said, GDPR, which is you know, going to crush startups or, or companies which just don't have a Google or Facebook style uh, sized uh, general counsel and budget, right? I like it. It's good for startups. Okay. Progressive, Justin, reg- what would you, what's progressive your, regulation. What's your, what's your, what's your like regulation? What would you, if you could, you were going to like try to, improve the state of the world through a tech regulation um i think that's a good idea i feel like uh what one thing you don't want to lose i guess it's you know i don't know if i have any original thoughts outside of matt one thing you don't want to lose is like the cool thing about the internet is we had this flourishing of all these different ideas because you could just make a website right that did like whatever you wanted you know and the, there were very few regulations in terms of like any of how you you know, how, how you design that site or create, you know, what types of products you could create, you know, people just tried many different things. Like when we were starting off, like everyone was trying like all sorts of different content, video, images, locations, pictures, live video streams, you know, there's this kind of like explosion of, came to an explosion of different ideas from which you've got all of these different, you know, companies today that are like, you know, huge companies that are, you know, integral to our daily lives. And so you don't want to kill that, you know? Um, and I, I think that, that, you know, it, allowing this kind of like a, a, uh, an open playing, you know, kind of playing field for new ideas and new startups is like, is critically important to like continuing the innovation cycle. So I guess progressive regulation, basically we should make it hard for big companies to, uh, you know, be ex- to exploitative things to, to their, their user base, but easy for startups to get started and try new things. What about uh, old right Jamie? Or is, is there a good thing, thing? Is good regulation? I don't know how I got this. I don't know how I got this nickname. Um, there's probably such Jamie a just thing wants to regulation. reinstate Trump onto the platforms. No. <laughs> um, J- Jamie, free market Quint. What's your? Have you met a regulation that you like, or do you think that there one exists? I'm sure that one exists. I just. I think that generally until you can pass more than 50% of regulations that are beneficial, you should just pass no regulations or get rid of bad ones. And I don't think that regulators have basically shown themselves to be equipped to pass regulations that are good at more than like a 50% rate. So it's net harmful rather than net beneficial. Um, Probably be better to figure out how to get rid of existing regulations than figure out how to add more new ones. you know, get rid of existing regulations and then maybe spend the extra effort that you uh, have conserved from having less things to enforce on enforcing the things that currently exist. Um, And then, you know, if we can successfully do that, then maybe we can add some. It's like we're adding to a broken system. So uh, it doesn't really make much sense to me. Burn it down. I've I've got got, uh, uh, two ideas I like. I don't know if they're like actually whether they actually work or not. Let's hear them. I'm not quite sure how to implement them, but like the first one is uh, one of the best ways new cool stuff gets made is people like scrape existing websites or like build things that like 
basically turn the website into like a pseudo API and then build on top of what's already exists. And then companies like pretty quickly are like have gotten pretty good at like blocking or destroying those APIs or suing those companies for like violating their like terms of service that says you aren't allowed to do that. But I actually think basically I think that's almost always anti-consumer. Like I don't know if it's not necessarily like I'm sure there are cases where people are actually protecting people's privacy or whatever. But I think that for the most part that leads to less innovation. So I think a regulation that says like basically you don't have to build a great API, but you can't stop people from reverse engineering what you've built to build APIs on top of it. Like you must. I think that's. You must. I think that's one that. of the one of the proposed bills right now. Oh, that's it's, great. I love that people. So that's, cool. that's, that's a good idea. Yeah, that's, that's like amazing. you have to. So this would be API. like like Twitter, for example, all the companies like, that build stuff on top of Twitter. Yeah, like it, and then you, sure, but yeah, I, exactly. the more the more obvious one to me is like, you're, let's say you're running. Uh, there's multiple competing marketplaces for something, right? So like, there's multiple companies doing rideshare. You could then. It, right now, they can block Google Maps or any map company or any company from building a meta search that like search that lets you try dispatching requests across multiple services and then auto canceling the the you know when one is accepts auto cancel the other one. Like and you can you can basically prevent people from building another layer. Or if you're a social media company, you can prevent people from building a different client. Like if you're have a feed product, you can't someone can't make a non addictive version of your product that gives you access to the same data but is designed to be have lower addictiveness and like that you can block them from building that. And I basically think that's generally not good. And I, I think that you have to, the, there's like some nuance there because if you want advertising as a business model, and I actually believe advertising as a business model is good because it, without advertising supported products, you can't have like free and open media. Um, all media goes behind a paywall and media behind a paywall is necessarily not the public square. And so I think that's actually like, you can't have a paper of record without advertising. So I think, there's something to like requiring people who use your APIs to like include the ads somehow, or like maybe you can charge for the APIs. I don't know. I don't even thought it through all the way, but like you have to charge for the APIs. Yeah, I thought it through. Okay, boom. <laughs> nice. Jamie, Jamie's in charge. <laughs> Jamie's in charge. But anyways, I, just think, to, I think that's a to... really good idea. Yeah, I love that. You have What's to charge the for the APIs one? because you can't control the viewability and like other metrics that advertisers care right. about um, when you don't. Uh, when you don't control the, the feed. Um, so it's right. kind of impossible based on like the modern metrics that people want to buy off of. And you can't actually enforce other people implementing those because um, it's hard to implement in the first place and any third party is basically liable to do it wrong. And then you create an audit cost if, if you have to like audit those people. Um, but anyways, paid APIs is, is uh, right. enforced paid APIs is, is maybe a good idea. I think that's like, the only realistic way because otherwise people will just find a way around it. Like they'll just make it technically very difficult or something like that. And then how are you supposed to tell a company they can't make it technically very difficult? They could just claim they have to do it that way for X, Y, Z reason that you can't audit because it yeah. involves their proprietary code and you know, like right. stuff like that. I don't know. Courts are actually pretty good at like detecting that kind of stuff. I Like I, uh, we have this assumption courts are like basically ignorant and, and can understand how tech works, but actually the recent like Oracle and Google lawsuit decisions and stuff like that, they like actually were like, no, we looked at the APIs. We determined that these APIs are trivial and this is the only way to do this. And so, no, we disagree with your argument on the basis of our own fact finding, looking at the code. And I was like, oh, well, if you spend a billion dollars on lawyers, if you spend a yeah, billion yeah. dollars on lawyers and discovery and expert witnesses, then then maybe you can do that. No, no, but the, the probably not in every like that, court case. It wasn't an expert witness, like the, the judge like and like the judges like a, i don't know assistant sort of went and themselves like reviewed the code which i was like oh that's amazing like that's that's like it's like you actually went and be like learned enough to evaluate the argument on its own merits instead of like relying on someone else to understand it and like that that's kind of cool anyway the second idea is specific to media uh you wind up with a lot of monopolies in the media space because basically the way licensing works it's so hard to get a deal with like the music industry or the TV industry or like uh, anyone who has these giant libraries that uh, what what winds up happening is uh, you uh, startups can't get started. It's like too hard. And so I think like some kind of like if you want to license your music or whatever or your your stuff, you like you have to you have to it has like to be radio. available like under a public f- license, like like the radio license. Like, exactly. Yeah. It's yeah. like, it's radio like license for all forms of media. Yeah, for well, all it's kind of similar to your, period. 
Yeah, it's kind of similar to your first idea, right? Because yeah. um, yeah, if you look at the history media. of media, it's yeah, it's always been oligopolies because it's all about content scale, right? Even yeah. when you had network TV, NBC, ABC, um, and today Netflix and Disney. Yeah, yeah. I yeah. guess if you force you them to license yeah. out part of their library, but then you know how how do you decide? What price it's done at and stuff, right? Because they just Netflix have to give everyone Disney the same price. Set. They can they, you set your own price. Yeah. So you have to give everyone the same price, and you can't distribute direct to consumer through the same company. So whoever holds the copyright has to sell it to the other company that's going to distribute to the consumer, and then they have to let other people also buy yeah. whatever that price that company buys at. Yeah. And that's just like interesting. You just so Netflix and Disney an wouldn't be able to own distribution. They just right. the you have to choose. You have to be on one. It's like it's like what they used to do with banks. Well, they could create two one, companies. What right? side of the fence do you? Yeah, yeah. yeah. You'd split the Netflix content and Netflix like distribution, or you know whatever yeah. the every whatever yeah. company you just split into two halves, and then other if other companies want to make a client side, sure. And if the if the distribution side wants to buy from another player, that's fine too. And I actually think that would so be would that... generally very pro consumer because you'd wind up with single media apps that enabled you to consume all the content through bundling. Even if you had to pay for the different right. sources independently, you could consume them all through the same experience. And it would then enable like copy, like basically lots more competition on the client side. I think you'd have much better media clients as a result. So how there's would that apply to Twitch? To, to, I mean, how would that apply potentially... to, like, Twitch, to Twitch streams? That's an interesting question. I mean, UGC is like hard. It's, the Twitch isn't like generally protected by copyright. Is that the primary? Like, I don't think we've ever said something, gone for someone for copyright reasons. Because it's like live basically has this weird thing where like, even if you steal a Twitch stream and put it somewhere else, they're not interacting. Or, or YouTube, room, so maybe, maybe, yeah, maybe YouTube is a better example. Sure, I think it's the same thing, which is like uh, you'd have to split it into a holding company. Like, I think Twitch would, in theory, apply the same thing to Twitch. I don't think it matters because we're a because we're a live business, it just works differently. But for sure, for any UGC clip site, you divide it into two halves. And I think that would be I think that'd be yeah. good regulation. Yeah, like a holding company and then a distribution yeah. company. Uh, and I think it's, right. It's, you're right, Matt. It's, it's just a special case of the API's idea, which is requiring there to be like an open, uh, an open interface that other people can build clients against. And I think if you can figure out how to do that, that's like very powerful. All right, Jamie, go ahead. Sorry, we're waiting. Oh, I was just saying that like there are some economics behind like bundling that would make it more expensive for some consumers get what they want. So it's not necessarily like a pure win for, for everybody, but I, I think that it would be mostly a win for most people. Um, yeah, that's fair. I mean, yeah, the way you talk about there's a reason why there's a reason why like cable companies invented bundling, right? It wasn't out of like the goodness of their hearts. It was because like the, the economics worked out, uh, you know, kind of, uh, better for them and actually better for consumers in, in some ways, uh, in certain cases. I actually just realized you can do the same thing with, instead of a copyright, just data generally, like you always have to split into two companies, the holding company that owns the database, of all the customer data, and then the client company that reads out of that. And you, you just, you have to sell via an API that has some cost. And like, basically you have to choose, are you distribution or are you storage? And like, yeah, Stratechery did some great articles. And, yeah. Stratechery did some great articles on this for like philosophizing about how Facebook could have been regulated better and how they could have basically enforced them to create kind of like some sort of open access system like along these same lines. But I, I think you're on the right track for what would benefit consumers the most. I mean, I, I think it would be great if people could build 25 versions of Facebook and then like there would actually be innovation on the, the social media layer. Whereas like now there's not going to be any because it's like impossible to build a new, the, the only way to build a new social network is to do something completely different, like TikTok, for example, but that's not like the same as Facebook. And so you end up with like stagnation in terms of like the type of social media that Facebook was. And then everybody has to switch to like a completely new type of social media, you know, for better or for worse. And you never actually get any innovation on like, the, the other kind because it's like well facebook's like well we'll just focus on instagram because that's like the new thing people care about and people don't care about facebook but maybe if there were like 30 people trying to innovate on the core facebook layer maybe they someone would discover like yeah the, and, and you'd the be next part of the s curve basically yeah you'd, no. you'd be i mean real data friends by city yeah real data portability would would be a huge win i think for consumers and technology but I'd, I'd, I'm realizing, yeah, do you guys I have any ideas part, also part of the bills yeah do you guys you have any ideas on how to work. implement that? Yeah. I'm actually kind of curious, okay. is there, do I you think, guys think I there's think a way to implement it that works? 
Yeah, I think there is a bill that's part of the, also part of these five bills that are going through one of, or that have been proposed. One of which, which is like specifies, I believe, I might be misremembering. One is data portability. Yeah, yeah. I'm more I curious like into uh, one. Like what I'm data port yeah. What I'm curious about is, is yeah. Okay. How do you actually make data port portability useful? I guess is is it, my main question. It has to be like live uh, online data portability. If if you just get an, an export button that like dumps all your shit into a zip file, that is not useful. If you can live import export, it has you're to be like yeah, it has to be enable, like Facebook read, write. Yeah, totally. Okay, it so you basically like you Facebook force connect. companies to provide this API. Yeah. You you, you people you need yeah. people to have like yeah an API access to like pull the data. And we did this I guess the write the companies, data. I don't know. Right? I feel like I feel like writing the data is a little bit more questionable. If I would, you know, but right. Hmm. We did this to the phone companies, though. Like, uh, like that was actually that's actually that's a good piece of regulation. I think that was had to happen. We're like, it used to be you had one big giant phone monopoly, and it got broken because the requirement was you must allow other people to interrupt with. Basically, you may not prevent other companies from interrupting into your phone network. You have to allow other people yeah. to build their own sub networks that connect in. That's actually a very similar idea of like interoperability across uh across networks and that, that worked actually that was that was good for the phone industry and for at least for consumers i don't know if it was good for like at&t right all right yeah i think the thing I is mean, like the those companies made money by charging consumers and so it's like it, it what happens with facebook when they can't charge consumers you know the ftc or whoever is forcing them to give away their data um it, which you know i guess i wouldn't trust them to do in a way that makes a lot of sense um but I guess we'll see what happens. All right. So I want to finish up with rapid fire questions. Uh, our producer, Jen, was like, you got to you got to do this section. So um, really quickly, what is one thing you've learned this week? We got to drop something for the audience, you know, like some some sort of gem. Some the, they came for the wisdom and they stayed till the end to get it from the three of you. What's one thing you've learned this week? Justin, you go first. What did you oh, learn? Fuck. I have a good one. <laughs> I'll, okay, I'll bail go you ahead, out. Jamie. Thank you. Thank God. Um, so I was getting I was getting screwed over by Turo this week. Um, so don't use Turo. But uh, <laughs> I anyways, I what I was what I was thinking is uh, that you know marketplaces, all these marketplaces which we were talking about earlier, have this uh, dispute resolution problem. So either the buyers or sellers will be unhappy. You know, so like eBay, maybe someone ships you a fake item. Um, you know, Turo, maybe some host lies that said you were smoking in the car or something when you don't even smoke. Um, and, uh, basically these companies, like you expect them to be fair. Uh, but I think what actually happens is they end up just completely biased towards the side of the marketplace that is, uh, that they have the hardest time with. And so if they have a hard, hard time, you know, for example, if Airbnb has a hard time finding people that rent out their homes or if that's like the limiting factor for their revenue they're going to be much more biased towards like giving those people a good experience um just naturally like maybe unconsciously but i i think that that will end up being expressed in these platforms and so i think that's actually something to think about when you're using any of these marketplaces is like am i on the right side and if i'm not on the right side am i like taking the appropriate precautions to make sure i don't get screwed basically it's not just a way so to I thought disguise it was... your rant <laughs> no i actually thought it, i actually so the rant, the, the rant helped me discover it, but I actually was thinking about this and I think it's like, people just expect it to be fair. Cause they're like, I'm participating in this marketplace. Like they want to treat me fairly, but I think, you know, everyone has their own motivations. Uh, and I think that that comes out maybe unconsciously and, you know, people should be thinking about that either when designing these platforms to maybe try and get ahead of like having that bias or to try not have that bias or when they're participating in the the platforms. I also like have had bad experiences on eBay in the past, like as a um, seller, because I think eBay is demand constrained now. So like, I, I think this comes out in multiple different ways. All right. I'll so give you that. Was, that, was, that was great. Go, okay. Go ahead, Emmett. Uh, I, uh, I wrote this like paper for Twitch called Twitch mechanics, which is a, breakdown of like the basically just like the core insights of everything we've learned about how the Twitch business works. That is mostly stuff that I thought basically I wrote down everything I thought was the most blindingly obvious things I know about Twitch all in one place. 
It turned out that was extremely valuable to other people in the company who have not been thinking about the problem for 15 years. And the tweet storm I realized was like the same thing. It's just like every, all of the most blindingly obvious things I've just known for a long time in startups that like, I almost can't remember to say because they seem so much like that's just how the world is. And that was also really popular. And so I think my, my learning is like, if you have been working on something for a long time, writing down what seems totally blindingly obvious about the area to you tends to come across to other people as like useful insight. And so I plan to try to do more of that. And I think it's like a, uh, it's a good way of doing nice. teaching, I think in some ways. It's the whole premise behind this YouTube channel. Um, <laughs> you know what, okay, I thought of one thing I learned. I learned today actually that 3 million people in America a year take out title loans. Like when they, where they're basically getting a loan collateralized by their car, which is, that's insane to me. It's a big market. What about you, Matt? What did you learn? Mm. Can't think of anything. <laughs> he's known. He's known everything all along. All right, let's move on. What is your one book recommendation? Like from recent book or just like any book? Recent, ever? just well, it could be any book yeah, ever or recent. Just yeah, whatever you want. I just read the uh, the new Andy Weir book. Uh, I think that's how you oh. say his name. Yeah. Uh, the 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 guy who wrote The Martian. Um, I was super, uh, super like math. He basically thought through all the math and science in like aggressively deep detail and, uh, actually really enjoyed reading it. Yeah. Project Hail Mary. It's really good. I should read that. Good rec. You know? oh, I'm surprised you haven't. It's really good. Yeah. You'd, lo you'd love I'll it. Check that out. Yeah. I like the Martian. Um, I think yeah. I recommend this to Emmett, the money, the unauthorized biography by Felix Martin. It actually debunks great. a lot of the common, there are a lot of common, what, what do we call it, mythologies about how money was created that actually aren't true. Um, it's pretty good history. Yeah, that's, that book's really good. Uh, I recently read this book, We Do. It's uh, by this guy, Stan, uh, let me see if I look it up again. Uh, Stan Tarkin. And it's like a book about like, basically it's basically a book about attachment styles and relationships if you heard about like avoidant and anxious attachment before that's like a lot of the basis of it although not everything and uh i thought it was like by far the best relationship book on that topic i've ever read uh and i personally like had a bunch of self-realizations about like how i show up in relationships and it had this one particular piece of advice in it that i like i thought was really cool because most of the time they avoid giving you specific advice it's all like oh you need to like feel out what's right for you and your partner and this book was like no there's like three things you must do for your partner and with your partner. And if you don't, your relationship is doomed. And it's like, uh, you have to be with them in joy when they have something that's like a worth celebrating where they're like very excited about celebrating something. You have to be with them in joy when they have loss, you have to be like, hold them in their grief. And, uh, you, uh, uh, have to care for them when they're sick. And if you fuck up any of these three things, your relationship is going to take a lot of damage and eventually die. So don't do that. And I was like, that is like such, I've like, I've noticed how oh. failure to do those things, either for my partner to do for me or for me, for my partner does have that ex like really long, like big ramifications. I thought that was like very insightful. I'd never heard it before. So Amazing. I recommend that book. It's good. We do. Uh, mine is Awareness by Anthony DeMello, which basically is the solution to whatever your problem is. It's like any problem that you have in the world. If you read this book, then he tells you how to reconcile yourself with it in a much more eloquent way than I could ever describe. It's great. Um, all right. The last one is what is one startup you wish existed? This is the payoff that everyone's been waiting for so they can go start the startup. I have a good one. Uh, one password or dash lane or whatever that actually works and works if you have like a bunch of different accounts because all those products are extremely painful to use when you have like more than two Google accounts or more than like two any accounts. Like it's like it's just a huge mess. Someone please start that company and then uh, let me know. Thank you. Truly reliable like Consumer Reports, the wire cutter, or whatever, where I can just like that's like super in depth and I can just go for anything I want to buy, and it has the answer. And somehow they convince me to pay for it so that it doesn't wind up getting hijacked by needing to drive affiliate fees. Like, and I don't know That's how that product gets started, but yeah, I really want that. Yeah. I was going to say something pretty similar, which is, uh, 
like the store that has the best one of everything, like the best, right. you know, mm-hmm. I thought of this actually, this was an idea I had like 12 years ago. It's like, just, they do the research and they have the best Japanese knives, the best car, the best, you know, whatever. I mean, I guess you'd need different cats. Kind of like thing, Bonnie's does for clothes or whatever, but so this, just for everything. This, yeah, but that's much more subjective. So this is yeah. like, uh, I think the reason why this, I think it's an amazing, I think it's an amazing idea. Um, I think like there's other startups like currently being built that could potentially enable this to exist in the future. So like fair wholesale, for example, is one part of the issue is that like a lot of these smaller brands that produce these types of things aren't really set up to sell on like quick, you know, production cycles. And they kind of like pre-sell a whole bunch of inventory that's ordered way ahead of time. And then, you know, people buy that and sell that. So it's hard to have a, like a, a store that you kind of build on demand of, you know, things, uh, unless you're like, basically like merchandising them way ahead of time. And so it's kind of like the almost similar to like the Facebook thing we were talking about, where if it was possible just to just have like a meta Amazon where everybody got access to this like catalog of stuff at like wholesale and like, you know, Amazon or some intermediary got some small markup and you could have like a whole bunch of innovation on like the front end, like what is the best website buying experience or something like that, or like curation experience really. Cause Amazon's great at selling you things you know you want. They're bad at selling you things you don't know what you want. And because they've kind of monopolized the whole rest of the process, they're also selling you the things that like would be better sold by some sort of different buying experience than type something into a search box, um, you know, like fashion or some of these other things. And uh, hopefully someday there'll be like a lot cooler uh, UI UX for buying some of those things. All right, Matt. Uh, I, th- I like a learning assistant that some machine learning or AI based learning assistant that can help you learn faster. There's like this open source thing called Anki that, you know, me and some, some other guys like Rajiv use, they, it's like very effective for learning stuff with space repetition, but it's like super janky. Um, yeah, it'd be cool if something just stored all that's the stuff that you learned and could just recommend stuff to you. You should check out this. Have you seen brilliant? It's like this app. I have, it's a math. Like, it's a math one, right? Yeah, math. Okay. And it's like they have yeah. other topics too. But yeah, math and other stuff. It's pretty cool. It's kind of okay. like yeah, high, yeah. I, I checked it. I had cool learning. Yeah. It's um an Asian woman's the founder, right? I think. I don't, I don't know. Yeah. 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 Look cool. cool. But I love the learning idea too. I've been thinking about that for a while. It's like you have the computer in your pocket, and like apps like Duolingo are kind of just the beginning, right? Where you have this new interface into people where you can do space repetition much more effectively and kind of personalized learning, but no one's really created the ultimate learning platform to teach anybody anything. Yeah, I think it, I think someone could build it, you know? I think I think people are leaning too much into pure AI and like, you know, why, why not make humans better? It's, I guess, you know, um, Neuralink is like trying to do that, right? But I think kind of maybe the step before Neuralink is could could just be software yeah yeah you just watch youtubes of how to do things learn that way yeah we right do, we should <laughs> this was a fun one you could do like a whole nother round of this i have a bunch of other things but all right what's another way i mean we can do another one let's uh, you tell me ask ask one let's, let's, this, is, this is this is more like a question. cat this is more like a well no no, no i mean i meant on the startup ideas one because th- that's like a fun oh. one but i don't have all another right. rapid fire we should just, we should just let's just make Let's just make the startup idea one like a consistent, like yeah, we can just bring that in next episode. Bring that in next episode. We'll just keep doing it. That's fine. I think that's we can do a bunch of sure we can do a bunch of those. Yeah. yeah, dude. Someone came up to me at uh, Miami Crypto Week and was like in a club, and they're like, you know, I started in my NFT startup. It was inspired by you, like what you did with like NFT or YouTube videos. You know, so it could be that's very dope. viable. That, yeah. Yes, it's dope. I'm, well, if you're watching this YouTube, then you should allow us to invest. If if yes, if we come, if someone post comes up it. with an idea, yeah. If you work on any of these ideas, post it in the comment, and we're each going to yolo a thousand dollars into your company. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good to me. If it's good, <laughs> if it's good, yeah. if especially it's caveat, especially it's Matt. Good. Except for, except for Matt, he'll just yolo a thousand dollars into all of them. Just no, just okay. post Actually, the link. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, if it's if it's an idea one of us wants, like. You know, at least we get some utility out of it, even if it's terrible investment, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. You know, so I have this idea for another. I mean, we might cut this part, but I have a. Um, I'm thinking about doing a Shark Tank on YouTube, 
like my own version of Shark Tank. And the way I'm seeing it, I'd love your feedback on it. The way I'm seeing it is like three angel investors, right? Uh, and one person, one founder, the founder comes and pitches, he pitches his deck or whatever. And we're like kind of, you know, there's feedback and we're like kind of asking questions. And then it's it's kind of like the design. So like the first person to invest, each each angel investor is investing like, let's say $33,000, something you can invest on the spot, right? So he could get up to 100,000. So this is like, I was gonna call the show first check. It's like basically for people who it's just an idea, right? And the valuation cap increases autom- programmatically depending on, like the first one is at a like whatever, right. $2 million cap. The second one is at 4 million, the third one is at six, or maybe it's like four, six, eight or whatever, right? So by the end of it, he has like $100,000 at an eight million cap and you could probably like parlay that into like a first, you know, a pre-seed round, right? Of like 500 grand or something. You should just, you you should just have the, the price tag declining in real time so it starts out at like 10 and it's falling 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 every day they have like a buzzer and you like you hit it to put your bid in but if you're the first one then it goes then it ratchets back like it like ratchets up from there and now like that's like frozen at that point i like the three gradations where it's like you know it's slightly more because it's kind of like i i kind of want to do more if there's a little bit of competition in real time between the right no, no, i was saying like how you set the the initial price for like price yeah. one, price two, price three, you set price one based on like the falling price. And then like, at some point somebody hits the button, like somebody could have a reserve price, right? So that if it goes too low, it's like- Right, so it's like it. throughout the whole episode, like starting right. at like minute one, I yeah, can yeah. just YOLO, like minute one, boom, I'm in $10 million. It's, it's, like, $10 million it's, like, voice. <laughs> it's like the voice, yeah, yeah. right? There's like some benefit to being like the first one. I don't know exactly what the mechanics of that show are, but you know, if like, yeah. they like hit the button first and they're the first one, there's like, well, I think they well, get I feel like in that's a great idea. If the first if the first thing is like two million dollar cap or something like really low, then you're kind of like you're actually quite incentivized because your money is like gonna trip you, you know, kind of like the theoretical valuation of it is gonna triple over the yeah. course of this show. If like the can you immediately in, sell like, it to the next person? Like if the next person <laughs> no, hits no, the no, buzzer in like it's, a, it's, a minute, it's, you get just like... gotta be in, in the spirit of angel. You know, you're you're holding on. You're, you're, the idea is like you're yeah. only funding the company if you actually want to have a relationship with this guy and you like want to fund it. But I mean, it's gonna be early stage, so you're effectively yoloing this shit anyways. So it's like kind of like how much am I willing to YOLO uh, like the, into this person, this founder, you know? I think it's a great idea. I have to go get dinner. Uh, All right. I, it's it's, it's yeah, a not a, here. I'm yeah, this is a good idea. idea. You good. should definitely do it. Yeah, I like so that. It's a good, I think it's a good show it. that I'm, you should do too, Justin specifically. Yeah. No, I'm gonna do. I'm gonna do it. I think. I think it'd be. I'm gonna do it and get some maybe right. some small angel investors with rolling funds and stuff. All right, great. Thanks for joining. We'll see you guys next time and uh, comment below what your favorite part was. Goodbye. Godspeed. Yeah. Okay. Send her make on sure the I guys. Wait. <laughs>